In the previous podcast, we discussed whether or not it is biblical for Christians to have some savings, to accumulate some wealth, participate in 401k type retirement plans, etc. And we decided based on the scripture alone, that as long as we can honestly say we love God more than we love our money and our wealth, as long as we can honestly say that we're depending on God, we have faith in him, we're not depending on our money or our wealth to make us who we are. And as long as we're not envying other people's money or using our money in the wrong way, there is absolutely no biblical problem at all. In fact, the Bible says things like a wise person will have some savings. But even with that answer in hand, I still have some folks who ask me about more specific detail of saving or investing. And those questions usually come in two general forms. One is I occasionally get the concern of whether or not Christians are allowed to earn interest on their savings, to earn interest on their money. And then they say, if we're not allowed to earn interest on our money, does that mean we can't earn dividends from stocks or see capital appreciation by buying a house for 150 and selling it for 170, et cetera? That question is almost always driven by a verse in the law of Moses in Deuteronomy 23. We'll cover that in just a second. And then the other question I get is, okay, so if we should be saving and saving up a little bit for a rainy day, should we only be investing with other Christians? Do I need to find a bank, for example, that is owned by Christians and only has Christians as clients? Should I only invest? My company has a 401k. They'll match. They give me five options of things I can invest in, which are almost always index funds for stocks or index funds for bonds. Should I invest in those things if those companies aren't all Christian, if they don't all sell Christian products and have Christian customers and Christian employees, etc.? Let's first knock out the question about can we earn interest? Even though some folks don't know where the specific verse is, they know that there is a verse in the law of Moses that prohibits the earning of interest. That law is actually in Deuteronomy chapter 23, verses 19 and 20. So let me read that for you. Moses told the people, you shall not charge interest on loans to your brother, meaning a fellow Hebrew. You shall not charge interest on loans to your brother, interest on money, interest on food, interest on anything that is lent for interest. You may charge a foreigner interest, but you may not charge your brother interest that the Lord your God may bless you in all that you undertake in the land that you are entering to take possession of it. Now, the first thing we have to notice is this isn't just a prohibition on charging interest on money, but on anything else. So if I am lending one Hebrew to another, then they were not allowed to say, hey, can you loan me nine pieces of bread? I'm having some guests, unexpected guests tonight, and I need some additional bread. And I'm not allowed to say, yes, I will loan you nine pieces of bread. But at the end of the week, you have to pay me back 10 pieces of bread. That would be earning interest on it as opposed to, yes, I will give you nine pieces of bread. And when you have an opportunity, you can pay me back exactly nine pieces of bread. Now, generally speaking, Christians are not under the law of Moses. All of those 313 laws found in places like Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy. Christians are no longer under that. We're under what the Bible calls the law of Christ. I've done a podcast on that. It's entitled The Biblical Explanation of Why Christians Are Not Under Old Covenant Laws. So you can listen to that podcast if you're interested. We're still under God's moral law, which is spelled out in great detail in the New Testament, just not the old covenant law. And that old covenant law included a lot of ceremonial things and food laws, et cetera, that Christians are simply no longer bound by. And again, that's not my opinion. It's not what I hope is true. It's a biblical fact. And I explain it in that podcast. But we also have to notice that here, this is a very specific thing that's being talked about. So in other verses in the Bible, in the law of Moses, they were told that they were to provide charity. So let's say, person dies at work and he leaves a wife at home with a couple of now orphaned children. And we're not really to loan them even the nine pieces of bread and expect the nine pieces of bread to come back. We're to give them, we're to provide charity to those individuals who are in greatest need in our society. For those who are, in this case, it says 
foreigners, those who aren't the same as us, those who don't practice our religion, we are allowed to charge them interest. If we're investing in a business, you want money. You tell me if I give you money, you're going to use that money to build a business. You're going to sell a product at a profit. And if I'll loan you my money, you'll pay me back either a set amount of interest or a certain percentage of the profit. That's not prohibited here. What is prohibited is just if it's a case where charity isn't required, but it's just a pinch. It's a cash flow issue, as the finance folks call it. Folks came to visit and you don't have enough bread. You happen to have heard me speak at work today that I've got too much bread. So, hey, can I borrow some of that? If I borrow nine pieces, I'll pay you back nine slices of bread. Or your wheat came in early this year. Your olives matured early this year. So you've got plenty of olives. My olives, which are a slightly different type, haven't matured yet. And so we make a deal with each other that says, when your olives come in, give me a portion of them because mine aren't ready yet. By the time mine are ready, you will have already consumed all of yours. And so for you give me 15 pounds of olives or wheat. And when them, when mine comes due, I'll give you the 15 pounds of olives or wheat. And in that sense, Moses is saying, we don't charge each other interest on that. We're a religious and an ethnic family. We have been set apart and called by God to bring the Messiah into the world. And we need to treat each other well. And we need to act differently than those who haven't been called by God for such an important purpose. And I think most of us today, though, again, we're not under those old covenant laws. Most of us today would think the same way. If a neighbor comes to me and says, I want to start a business. And I think if I open this taco truck up, I can make a lot of money. So if will you loan me some money and give me $10,000 and in 15 months, I'll pay you back $11,000. That's perfectly okay. They're going to make a profit. We're simply allowing them the resources to do that. They pay us interest in order to facilitate that, et cetera. But if a family member comes and says, if somebody at church comes and says, again, a Sunday school teacher or a deacon or a widow at church comes and they need help, well, we need to make that decision. Is this charity I give to this person and I'm not going to ask for anything in return? Or maybe it's like, well, they make more money than me. They have fewer kids than me. They live in a bigger house than me. I don't know that they're a charity case per se, but you're my biological family member and we attend the same church together. I'm not going to charge you interest if I loan you the money to buy your plane ticket, knowing that you're going to pay me back when you get paid the following Friday. So that's kind of the way that Deuteronomy 23rd admonition was written. That's how it was used. We're not under that particular law any longer anyway, but the basics of it still makes sense to us, I think. But that in no way would restrict us from depositing money at a bank and earning interest on it, buying a stock and being paid dividends on it, loaning something to someone who wanted to start a company of their own, and then asking them, when you pay me back the $10,000, i am going to need you to pay me back like 11000 actually to make me feel like I'm, I've come out whole in this thing. There's no biblical admonition against that at all. I think... All Christians would agree that there are some enterprises, however, that we shouldn't be investing our money in, illegal operations, people that are importing illegal cigarettes into New York City or people that are running gambling rings in places where gambling is not legal. We shouldn't obviously be investing in those kind of things. They're breaking the law, etc. There may be companies, however, that we personally feel are not breaking the law but they're breaking God's moral law. They're not breaking the law of the state, but they're breaking God's moral law. And there's actually a verse in Romans 14, 23rd verse of Romans chapter 14, that talks about if our conscience isn't right, if we can't do something in faith, then even if it's not a sin overall, it could still be a sin for us. And I think that comes into play heavily in answering this question. What type of companies should we invest in? And it's not just Christians. I've heard non-Christians say, I don't invest in, and they'll list out, I don't invest in tobacco companies. I don't invest in liquor companies. I've heard more and more people say that they don't invest in companies that do social media 
because they feel like the tobacco, the liquor companies, the social media companies, they feel like maybe they're doing more harm than good in society. They're not interested in making a quote unquote quick buck if it's going to cause more net harm to society. So that's not just Christians who think that way. There's a number of folks who think that way. And I understand the Bible doesn't tell us that we have to pull ourselves out, live out of the world, tuck ourselves away in compounds and only buy, sell and invest among a group of dedicated hardcore Christians for things that directly serve the kingdom. You can only invest in enterprises that print and sell Bibles or Sunday school material. The Bible doesn't say that. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul talks about if someone is a Christian in our church fellowship and they're sexually immoral or they're swindling people, then we need to not associate with those people. We need to challenge them that their sin is wrong if they say they don't care or they don't agree that it's wrong, then Paul says you really need to kind of separate from those individuals if they claim to be a Christian and are not acting that way. But he says, I don't mean at all that you can't deal with the greedy or the idolaters of the world. He said, since then, you would need to just go out of the world. How can you live in the world and never interact with somebody who's not a Christian? It's just really not feasible to do that. A great biblical example. John chapter 4 is famous for the account of Jesus speaking with the woman at the well. Beautiful story about Christ accepting all and our past never has to define us. Christ can always reinvent us. John chapter 4, woman at the well. Beautiful, beautiful scripture. Tucked in that story, we're told that when Jesus was speaking to the woman at the well, John chapter 4 verse 8, we're told that Jesus had sent his disciples into a nearby town to buy food. Now, it's interesting because parenthetically, John tells us in verse 9. So John 4, 8, he tells us that he had sent the disciples into town to buy food. John 4, 9, he reminds us Jews in those days had no dealings with Samaritans. The Samaritans and the Jews were related both ethnically and religiously, but they were not the same and they were not fond of one another. And technically the Samaritans did not follow all of the precepts and rules that the Jews followed in those days. But Jesus doesn't say we're in Samaria, but you guys have to go all the way back into Judea to a city to find kosher food and buy from someone who's exactly the same as us religiously. Jesus said, just go to the nearest Samaritan town and buy food there. And so I think that tells us we aren't required to only deal with what we are required to do is live differently, to love differently, to forgive more boldly, to be more compassionate, more merciful, to tell people how important Christ is to us, how Christ has redeemed us. We are definitely to be different than the world around us in terms of how giving and understanding and patient we can be with people. We're to be different from the world around us and how when the culture approves of something, slavery or prostitution. If the Bible says it's wrong, we will stand against it, even against the strongest headwinds. We will say, as we have done historically, those things are wrong. But can we go to the nearest Samaritan town and buy food? Yes. In fact, Paul even, in that same letter that he wrote to the church at Corinth, where he talked about, we, we're not supposed to just come out of the world. We can deal with these bad people as long as we're not letting them hypocritically reside in our church as well. In that same letter to that church at Corinth, Paul says it's okay for them to eat meat that was sacrificed to pagan idols. And and folks had a hard time with that. And so Paul said, if your conscience doesn't allow you to do this, then don't do it. But technically, God made that animal. And God made the butcher that butchered the animal into steaks after it was sacrificed. And as long as you're thankful that God has provided you food, then it's okay if you eat meat that's sacrificed to idols. So there are different biblical examples we see 
The Bible doesn't tell, Christ doesn't tell, Paul doesn't tell Christians, pull yourself completely out of society, live in a cave only with other Christians, and only eat, buy, and sell from people that are other Christians. That would be a difficult thing to do. It would certainly be possible if the Bible said that's what we needed to do. It's exactly what I would do. But the Bible doesn't say that. So can Christians invest in one of the six index funds that their company's 401k offers? And I think the answer is yes, you absolutely can. But again, I think Christians should always be acting on our principles. We should always be cognizant of that Romans 14, 23 verse. If it bothers your conscience, if you can't say in perfectly good faith, I am doing this as a Christian, then for you, that is a sin and you do need to pull away from that. And so if all the index funds that your company offers includes companies that you just simply cannot stomach, then you will need to find. Maybe you invest in bonds or invest in CDs. Maybe you buy real estate or things like that. But generally speaking, depositing your money at a bank purchasing certificates of deposits, owning annuities, all of those things, again, 401ks, stocks and bonds, all of those things are okay. Let's just be very careful that we're not overly investing or only investing in companies that do things that seem a little morally shady. Let's make sure we never do anything that violates our conscience, which is based on our faith in Christ. And let me close with one more Quick qualifier here. Proverbs 13, 11 says this. Wealth gained hastily will dwindle, but whoever gathers little by little will increase it. And I would paraphrase that this way. Christians should not be involved in get rich quick schemes. There are things where we can put our money on deposit at a bank. We can buy a bond. We can buy a stock. And that money is used to make the overall economy wealthier and healthier. So society benefits. People have jobs. People have incomes. Products are being made that people can purchase. Services are being produced that can serve the customers. While these people are employed at this company, these people are buying the products of this company. And it's really helping their life out. That's valuable. That's the little by little increase of just saving, accumulating, investing, and letting it grow. The Bible is saying wealth gained hastily will dwindle. Do not get involved in get-rich-quick schemes. And I think those come in different ways. There's gambling. Oh, I'm going to make a fortune. I figured out the ponies or whatever. There's gambling. There's pyramid schemes. And I think in today's world, the Bible would include things like meme stocks and probably even cryptocurrencies. When a meme stock hit something and it takes off and everybody on social media is supporting it and it goes way up and you want to buy it real quick and sell it before everybody else does and then it crashes down. Our cryptocurrencies which seem to be of iffy value probably at best. I think here's what happens. When you buy a meme stock or you begin to invest in cryptocurrency, you're really not doing it because you see the long-term benefit to society in general of this robust economic growth and financial stability. You're hoping you're going to buy that cryptocurrency and it's going to double or triple in value and you're going to be able to cash out for some wealth that was gained hastily. But here's the, here's the Christian concern with that approach. When you buy a meme stock, when you invest in a crypto or things like that and it pushes the value up, that draws other people in. And if those people get drawn in, they don't have the wherewithal perhaps that you do to invest in assets like that. When that crash comes, if that crash comes, other people can get hurt really bad financially. And Christians would never want to be a part of blowing up a balloon and then having that balloon pop and really, really harm some other people. So when we deposit at a bank, when we invest in a company that grows food or makes educational things or they print books or they make clothing for people or they make comfortable shoes or a million other things that we need and that make our life better. When we invest in those things, we don't make a quick killing. We don't get rich quick. We only increase little by little, but we're helping society be more productive. So I would caution it's okay to save. It's okay to earn interest and dividends. It's okay to have 401ks and to invest in stocks and bonds. Here's what I would caution. Romans 14, 23 says, 
if you're investing in something that bothers your conscience, that you can't do in full good faith to Christ, don't do it. That is a sin for you. And Proverbs 13, 11, don't try to get rich quick. Don't say, oh, this is the next big idea. And when this company takes off, their stock's going to go 10 times. Because be careful. You can get into that flow. It's like a gambler when they think they get on a roll. Be careful about Romans 14, 23, and be careful about Proverbs 13, 11. Otherwise, I think Christians should have some money set aside. And I think it's perfectly fine to earn interest or to grow those assets productively. Thanks so much for listening. Until next time, this is Andy.